I've got so much to catch up on. I oh, know. I don't know where to start. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know either. <laughs> I suppose I don't know either. Yes. Well, where we could start is right at the beginning where I met you, which was really fortuitous and strange yeah. and not how people would expect. Are we going to do... Oh, so we're gonna, are we going to lay the ground? Are Why gonna, not? With, with the... Yeah. Why not? So I know your godfather, yes, Ray, very well. who is the most wonderful man and he's one of the people in life that I don't see enough and I text saying oh we should have a coffee and then it never happens and I feel yeah, really yeah, shit yeah. about that don't I love Ray don't he's fine he's fine he's lovely so he's your godfather I'm like, he's a photographer I was working with him one time and he said you are going to love my godson's music and mm. I was thinking oh god yeah 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 yeah. I don't want to listen to this what if it's awful what do I do and I watched the video of you in Rizzle Kicks and was like, who the hell are these two? They're yeah. amazing. This is so fun. This is what we need at the moment. And then I think literally a week later, I was playing it on the radio. Yeah, mad. It, w- it was one of those, what's it called? Serendipity. Yeah. Serendipity, synchronicity. Because we had, fortunately, we had everything. We had all the artillery ready for that moment. But it was fortunate, you know, and... But I I, I, I want to credit myself and Harley for we did have this kind of year. We didn't go to uni. We, we decided to have our gap year as a, a grind gap year. We were just going for it. And, um, yeah, we emailed, we rung everybody. Yeah. Everybody we knew in London to do with music. Do you know what I mean? I would play it to them. Ray was more in touch than that, of course. So when he heard I was doing music, he was really into it. But, yeah, we had managed to do enough promoing and website development and and we'd made this music video with my friend Toby um so when you heard it we were ready because you said I think it was one of your producers who got in touch and we actually had fortunately that just established the infrastructure to be able to act on it which was amazing and because of that I mean our life changed because you did that you put us as record of the week maybe it was a month then no week it was a week yeah a week yeah um and then and it was we, I remember it so clearly, you know, we were in the charts at that point at 144. That was what we were doing with all of our little groundwork, you know, because that's probably quite a good result, actually. From, Amazing yeah, result. Yeah, yeah, And then it was July 2011, and the end of that month, we were number eight, I remember. And that was it. Wow. Captain I mean, Fun. I, Captain I, Cotton. Yeah, but do you know what? I'm, I've been, I was very lucky at that point in my career that I had any sway on anything. Yeah. And I'm only ever a tiny part of that like you say that whole journey but it's a beautiful thing I loved being able to do that that was the best part that was the job for me going oh my god this person's amazing this band are brilliant whatever but if the song's crap and it doesn't resonate it doesn't matter what I'm doing do you know what I mean it has to connect with people and what you were doing and that sort of fun and levity that you brought yeah just people just loved it it was infectious and it carried you on to this like amazing ever-changing career journey that you're still on I'm still on it's ever undulating and moving and changing and you've done so much since then I mean more recently you've done some sublime acting which (laughs) little bits yeah but some amazing things Star Wars and like some very very cool parts yeah 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 no the acting thing was a a actual mistake um, which is cool I I think that will maybe infuriate all actors listening. Um, <laughs> Who like, cares? Because it's the worst. It is. It's the of all the. I've. I've. I am someone who feels obliged to express themselves in kind of any medium. That, mm. That's. I've got to this point, you know, kind of ten years in, where I have to just accept the fact that I like doing loads of different things. I envy those who can focus on one thing, but then I speak to people who focus on one thing and they talk about. Yeah, one. yeah, yeah. Um. And so yeah, so. Uh, I try my hand at anything, but of all the industries I've I've been in or worked in at all, I'd say acting is the most savage. Really? Yeah, yeah I'd say I'd say the acting world is is pretty horrendous. Actually, in terms of self esteem, or I think I think so. So just to explain the accident side of it, I I, I as I began acting because um, I actually, me and Harley got a, a me. Harley, by the way, is an incredible actor. Mm. He, he's he's taken his time, but when he's gonna be, I'm very confident about it. Even if it's something I write, like he or he writes, he's very talented. But he um, he'd been battling, he's been battling with anxiety. But I'm sure we'll talk about that at some point. But um, uh, we both got meetings because we had done well and we'd been in the line. We were in the public eye, so we got these kind of meetings do you want to do any work in acting? I actually said no. I said to my agent, I don't want to act. I would love to write and direct one day. Um, Harley's the actor, you know. And then, uh, but because I was so mouthy in interviews, 
I got given this wild card <laughs> audition uh, for a show called Glue, written by <clears throat> Jack Thorne, who's now one of the greatest British screenwriters there is. He's re- he wrote the Harry Potter play. He wrote. Um, he's collaborated with Shane Meadows. He wrote on Skins. This is England. Anyway, he's and his dark materials. I just I'm obsessed. Yeah. I love him. Um, but yeah, so I read the script and thought it'd be rude for me not to audition. And I just happened to be the character. Let me just, I need to explain this. I just happened to be, at that time, a fucking mess. The character <laughs> was a fucking mess. And it just synced up. I didn't know how to audition. I didn't know how to do anything. I turned up to audition and tried to get naked because that was wow. in the script. And the guy was like, please, please keep your clothes on. <laughs> but they were like, he's fantastic. Do you know what I mean? Because that would have been... <laughs> Something different. I turned up late. I didn't. I, I didn't have. I it's was always just... the way. When you go really wanting something and trying too hard, yeah, it never, never works, works out. And that's what I mean about it being savage with acting. All right. actors will actors will will, will say that will will they'll clarify this. Mm. It's they can these people can sense desperation. It's, un- yes. it's unattractive. Yes, yeah. I I had that experience once, yonks ago. This is when I was in my early twenties, and I'd been I don't know I was doing probably top of the pops or something at the time. And um, ITV were like, oh, we really want you to audition for Love Island, which was a very different concept to the one that is on the telly the, today. The, the it was like celebrities and whatever. Yeah, it was yeah, in yeah. Fiji. And I was like, oh, I don't know if it's very me. So I went. I think I'd had two hours sleep. I was hungover slash maybe still even a bit drunk, to be fair. Right. <laughs> and I was just a bit like whatever in the meeting. Like, yeah. They're like, what do you think you could offer it? I was like... I was just sort of what, a yeah, bit whatever, yeah. and I got the job. Yeah. But then since then, after that, I was like professional. Out there. Yes, I was wearing my prepared. Best outfit. I'd slept for twelve hours. Yeah. Didn't get a bloody sausage. Yeah. It's ridiculous. It's mental. I know it doesn't make any sense, and it still it still continues. It's an energy thing. It's an intention yeah. field thing. But, but isn't that interesting? Because it's even the same with dynamics with partners, friends. That when you have someone who's so go. eager and overbearing, you're like, oh no. But when someone's a little bit not even standoffish or cool, but just their energy is more contained. You're like, oh my God, I'm quite curious about this person. Yeah, Who are you're drawn they? to it. I'm not very good at doing that. I'm, I know. I, I, I think the I'm sweet spot. I think the, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the sweet spot is is preparation and then and then and then surrender. Letting go. Yeah. I think it probably takes years to master. Yeah. But I think like it would be stupid to be because I had a phase where I think I consciously tried to under prepare. That also doesn't work. <laughs> Acting like you're underprepared. I, yeah, I once because yeah. I once got. Uh, well, yeah. So to, ca- to carry on, uh, basically, I I got grilled in an audition for Glue. I got like five five recalls, which isn't normal. So wow. I was I was chemistry tested a lot because it wasn't like let's shove this little pop star into the show. It was like can this pop star like, act? And um, I got the part, so which was crazy. And then for, since then, I feel like I've just been falling forwards. I've been I've had a, I, I lived with one of the the main actors in the show. He ended up living with me after we did Glue, and I saw his kind of thing with acting, and I kind of accepted that there's a whole other level. He's called Billy Howell. He's an incredible actor and will be huge. But it's just you know his, the way he was, I don't know, engaging with it. There's it's 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 lethal because as an actor, you're constantly employed and unemployed. Yeah. There's no control. There's no, there's no, or there's no reaction, there's no reactivity. So for me, with music or writing uh, or books or whatever it is, if I feel a pushback, I actually have it within my power to do something about it. Yeah. With, in acting, if you, if you get to the last two, three, or don't get anything or whatever else and you don't get it, you have to wait. Mm. I hate that. That's why actors go, listen, actors can be some of the wildest people you'll ever meet in mm-hmm. your life because they've got all this off time. And that's also why I think actors end up with actors, but... Yeah, yeah. I, I there was bits of my career that I think mimicked that where I was solely TV presenting and mm. every January I'd shit myself because there'd be nothing in my diary for 12 months right. and I would just have to wait. Hence why I now don't do any of that yeah. and I've tried to create something where there's more control and I feel like you know we're very similar in the fact that we're probably not very good at sitting back and waiting. So, mm. you know, that ha- having a creative endeavour is really key to staying feeling good. Yeah. And you've branched off into all these areas, not content with just doing the music thing or just waiting around for acting jobs and auditions. You're doing solo music now, yeah, which yeah. you know I've loved. Yeah, yeah I've so listened cool. To a ton yeah, of it I love that. It's brilliant. That. But also now this gorgeous book that lies on my yeah, desk here, it's The mad. Missing Piece, which is so beautiful. And I texted you the other day because. I read it to my kids the other night and you were like, what? You're reading it to your kids? This is, I didn't know that this was going to happen. And it's like, 
Yeah. This is what's going to happen now. Loads of families will read no, it. No, you're the. I think you actually might be the first parent ever to read that book to oh. their children. That's wild, isn't it? Because that wasn't even planned. That's so. I lucky. didn't even think about that. I didn't think you'd do that. Of course, <laughs> we have to test it out on these little blighters. <laughs> I, I mean, know. they loved it, and it's got a beautiful. We're going to get onto all of this. It's okay. Got, it's got a beautiful undercurrent that adults can pick up on and take heed of because usually the messages that you want your kids to understand are the ones that we still really struggle with as adults yes. because we probably weren't taught it or yeah. it's just still the culture we live in is quite toxic in a lot of ways and yeah. stops us from really understanding what's what and the message in this book you know being we'll get onto the deeper level in a minute but for a kid being very much it's not in the end result the thing getting the thing it's it's all the spontaneous happiness mm. and what happens along the way and i chat with my son about this all the time who's obsessed with pokemon cards and right. he'll go to me every morning can i buy some pokemon cards pokemon and i'm like cards, are they still <laughs> they're still going mate that is an incredible industry that there's st- oh you tell me about my it. little to be fair my little brother does i've got a, fu- a little half brother he, oh he is obsessed the yeah. amount of money we've spent on pokemon cards <laughs> and i keep saying to him look it's you're, if you get a pack and there's nothing in it, you're just going to be disappointed for the rest of the day. But if you get a pack and it's got a great oh. card in it, you're going to feel good for about 10 minutes. And then in an hour, you're going to go, can I get another pack? Your pain, yeah. And it's just this cycle. And I'm, I mean, he's like, what are you talking about? I just want a shiny VMAX. That's <laughs> all, like, stop giving me Yo, this. Sorry, I know, I know, there's an, I know you're going uh, in, a, in a, a path on this, but just as a side note, there's a Pokemon card store in Holloway, where, where you can get the kids to pick the, the, the shiny out. I'm never going there. No, 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 because then they pick it. And it's only like a fiver. Yeah, but then he's going to go, can we go there every day? Like, my son will just now think that that's how you get Pokemon cards. You go and you true. spend extortionate amounts of money on the shiny card he wants. Okay, fair enough. I'm trying to teach these moral lessons through the medium of Pokemon cards. It's going badly. Um, but they are designed beautifully. They are designed beautifully. There's some really... I saw... I, when I took my little brother to that store... I was like, God damn, these artists are really quite abstract, actually. This is what Rex said. Rex said, Mum, look at the artistry. <laughs> look at these characters. He's trying to get me hooked into it. But it is, it's an essential piece of messaging that I don't think... And it's not just for kids, because we're all doing it to an oh, extent. Mate. We're all looking for, you know, whether it's the promotion, the perfect partner, the holiday, the pair of shoes. And we still have this um, strange, mythical conclusion that that's going to make us then feel happy forever or complete or better than we did beforehand but it's ephemeral it comes and it goes and it's Mm. then it it, we need it again and it's I mean how are you doing with that one with with a desire for more and more and more um yeah I'd say I'm insatiable yeah Mm. it's the human condition sadly yeah I think I think the idea of enough I mean I understand it you know I understand it in theory I heard a great quote the other day, which is that freedom is the absence of want, mm. which I like because it's difficult to put a, a finger on freedom sometimes, you know. Yep. Um, and maybe that still isn't it, but I like the sound of it. I, you know, I've got an addictive personality. I'm, I am an addict. I think that's what people say. I'm, I'm an addict in, in, in that I have that capability to become obsessive with things um, and definitely love a dopamine rush. But I, I do think that there are steps I've taken in my life that have, lessens the impact or lessens the desire for the constant need of dopamine actually from removing some of the dopamine which is an interesting one um uh, definitely in terms of my career and and who who i am as a person you know the kind of more egoic desires for sure man i'm always thinking about like it's not enough i've got to do this and that i did this into one thing recently a game theory i'm not sure if it's called game theory but an outlook on life looking at it specifically as a game right which really helped me because um the person was basically saying i'm going to paraphrase here and i'm not doing it justice but he says this guy who's probably a very qualified philosopher (laughs) he said that he said that um if you were to look at particular goals or achievements in your life as games if you were to approach it as a game then at least you'll know when that game's complete and then you know that you're setting another game right Mm. and that resonated with me because for example I've had a total complex about Rizzle Kicks um, because, you know, I've been in a, I've been around this entertainment industry now for a decade, and I've seen, I've started to see the ups and downs and the curves, and people come and go, and people, you know, go into this crescendo and all this kind of stuff. And there was a point where I was so wanting to be this idea of myself that I'd created that I'd almost forgotten completely what I had achieved, you know. 
And I think it was difficult with Rizzle Kicks because it's not that no, it's not normal for it to go that quickly. Like you put it as record of the week and it went. And then we were there for four years, decided to take a step back. But I've seen people's trajectories go a lot, to last a lot longer. They've gone through a lot more rejection, a lot more fighting, a lot more, you know, and then they finally get this. Little Sim is a great example. Finally, 10 years of hard, hard work for Simbi. And then she's like, you know, popped off. And But with us, it was like, first go. <laughs> it was like, what? Mm. Do you know what I mean? So I had this idea in my head of like, does everything just happen like that? Yeah. And then I had to tell myself recently, this is recent, this is like within this year or maybe even last year, like I I have to just accept the reality that I achieved all my goals. I completed the music game in my mind in a year. We got we had a platinum album. That's all I ever wanted was a platinum album. But I'd never let myself just go, well done, you've completed that game. Yeah. Now everything else is a bonus or maybe there's a new game, you know? Mm. And And I think that feeling really did help calm that that desperation for and i used it as well with with um with sobriety actually i used to say that without before i even heard this game theory i used to say that almost as a joke i heard it from a friend people will be like oh you don't drink anymore i'm like yeah i completed it i completed drinking mm. <laughs> but it's so, do you know what it's so interesting when you look at that model in terms of success what you've just described there is the perfect example of how all of this goes against the grain of what we're taught in society so yeah. we're told you know, you could look to social media, to TV, to newspapers, to whatever infrastructure is going around in our culture. And the myth being that when you have success, you, you feel complete. You are fine. Yeah. You are happy forever. And you've just described this sensational success that happened in, let's say, 12 months. Yeah. But you didn't go, now I am happy forever. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to sit back and chill, which we're all hoping happens but it doesn't. No, and we all kind of know that and we can hear millions of stories about CEOs at the top of their game who are completely in bits and mentally a complete mess or pop stars or movie stars or whoever it is at the top, top of their game. And they still have all the issues from the past, the lacking they felt before they were successful. Nothing changes about who you are as a person. Mm. It's just how other people treat you. That's the bit that changes because they they imagine that you're something different, yeah. that you oh, are so untouchable true. or whatever. And it's like, oh no, I've still got all the same bag of shit that I'm carrying around and stuff going on. And nobody really wants to hear that because we all hope, first of all, that when we reach this pinnacle, we will feel different. But also it gives us all um, almost an excuse to go, well... it it's all right that I feel so terrible or that I'm angry or that I'm pissed off because I haven't got there yet. Yeah. But when I do, or you can look at other people and go, well, it's all right for them because they've reached that point and I haven't. So yeah, I yeah, can yeah, be yeah, in yeah. suffering. But it's if we just dismantle the whole thing, it's like terrifying. Yeah. Terrifying. So when you reached that, and I heard a bit about this on your TED Talk, which I, I only stumbled across recently and I absolutely loved it. You completely you? nailed it. It was brilliant. Oh, I learned great. a lot about you that I didn't know. Yeah. But when you reached that pinnacle of everything that you desired as a musician, as a teenager growing up, wanting to get a platinum album, when you reached that pinnacle and looked around and went, I am, like you say in the TED Talk, I'm one of the top dogs now. I'm like, yeah. I'm up there with the big players. I'm mixing with everybody else who's done very well. And you had that realisation that you didn't feel complete. You didn't feel this ultimate everlasting happiness. What then? Mm. What did I, what actually did I do? I ended up making some pretty awful music. I remember, <laughs> I remember after with Rizzle. No, we had the second album. <laughs> we had the second album that did well. Um, but then we, that's it. So we, I suppose we had a different, the, the expectations rose uh, around There's us. There's always the next level. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, and I suppose the goalposts moved and our desires uh, became bigger and larger. And then all the pushbacks became more painful. And I think, um, you know, a couple of decisions, I think we, there was slight, slightly different creative decisions. I mean, you hear this a lot with music, the slightly different creative directions and desires between myself and Harley and, and perhaps the label. I, I've, we you know, we never meant to be pop stars. We only wanted to make music and we love making music. And then we found ourselves, we found ourselves detached from an idea of our, us. Uh, we, we found that 
there was a new idea of us that was outside of our control and people were talking about this idea and we felt as though you know we and also by the way we were like fucking 20 years old oh, no. do you know what i mean so it's like so these these so these like freak outs now i look at 20 year olds now i'm thinking fuck me i was that age yeah. of course i was freaking out so i was wanting to be you know all the things you know taken seriously or respected uh-huh. all this kind of stuff on the basis that even though we were in this pop market we were making the hip hop we grew up loving you know and then but you know the more commercial songs were the ones that are played and da 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 anyway so we're in this whirlwind of of opinion and critique and um and also success and and yeah so that was hard um but we were ultimately just trying to make music man we're trying to make music we're trying to balance making music we loved and 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 being current and whatever the fuck you have to worry about i was a little bit worried about myself harley began to his issues began to come up too um i can't really speak i mean that's for him to talk about yeah, yeah, yeah. And, I, and i'd love for him to speak with you about this actually but it was just to do with anxiety generalized anxiety we took a year off to to, to regroup um I, I made some other music i made this music with a group called wilded a band i, I formed which is like the antithesis of rizzle kicks so i just wanted that outlet and harley made some incredible solo music as jimmy charles moody which just honestly blows my mind and then we came back together and it was just it just didn't feel like running back into the pop world was the best idea. And it was at the, um, this is a more of a, a kind of a, like nerdy maybe like outlook on it, but it was at the, the transition into streaming. So we were, we were watching labels have absolutely no idea what, how to deal with streaming. Yeah. So we were like, we're just going to let this, you know, this one, so we take, take a step back and then we just grew up. That was it. I, I, I feel like I started to grow up at 26. I, I remember thinking that and I, and loads of things hadn't processed. I hadn't processed where I'd been. I hadn't processed the gigs we'd done. Um, it's all too quick. It was, yeah, so. yeah. So I just, I just did a lot of that and then, and then, um, you know, focused on trying to grow up and then I had to, was confronted with, the next stage of life, which is you know interpersonal relationships and um, and uh, becoming a mature person, uh, which is something that you, that definitely the entertainment industry fame in itself can definitely delay. You live yes. in a kind of suspended state of existence. It's such a cliche, but it's absolutely true. Yeah. I mean, I think it took me decades to not be a teenager. Yeah. like decades. How old were you when you started? Fifteen. Presenting? Fuck off. Yeah. Serious. Yeah, 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 yeah. And 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 working like every week How in that environment that? with yeah. adults and commentary, and it took me years. Probably in my thirties, where I started to go, wait a minute, I still am mentally fifteen here. I need to yeah look at everything and change everything. And you know that's where everything imploded, and I changed the whole thing. But I think yeah. it, it, it is a it is a cliche and. But it's a very, very true one, sadly, because it it's such a strange environment to find yourself in. Um, yeah. And during this TED Talk, again, as I said, I learned so much about your life and your experiences. And we've been texting a bit over the last couple of years because we have an amazing mutual friend, we Donna do. Lancaster, yeah. who I've probably mentioned on this podcast like <laughs> at least times. once a month because yes. she's, she's sort of a mentor to me in life. I know she has that kind of role with you as well where you can speak to her as yeah. a great friend and a, a wise wise person in your life and I, I love her she's got a beautiful book out called the bridge yes and she helps so many people out there um find some equilibrium and peace and and all that good stuff that we want so we've we've spoken a bit about this but there was a I was about to say missing piece without realizing like, <laughs> it was a pun for your book but there was a missing piece like watching your TED Talk, I had no idea that you'd you'd had addiction issues, that uh, you had, there was drug use. I didn't know about any of this. So yeah. where in the timeline... It's very high-functioning. Did that fit <laughs> in? Um, yeah, so it was, it was almost cliche. So when I was saying I was a bit worried about myself after the second album, that's what I was talking about. So mm. I remember I remember getting into cocaine like just, just after... I can't remember when it was. There was a point where... I, I want to say I'm not I can't be specific, I'm not sure about the specifics yeah. but there was a point where I had finished I think we'd finished the second album or something like that and there was this gap I remember this gap between finishing it and it being released and you know the type of mind I have I couldn't I wouldn't be able to listen to it without wanting to change something the idea of being not being able to change it was, was hard for me especially now with this newfound expectation the first album was like everything's uh, a plus yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> second one I'm like oh my god and there was this gap in time and I just remember just having like time money 
and you know attention which is a savage combo Ooh, for like a yeah. 20 year old boy <laughs> who also was a weirdo i was i was an odd teenager i wasn't like this kind of like I wasn't like a jock or whatever the the UK equivalent. <laughs> you know what I mean? What is it? Uh, what is it? Like yeah, a, what is an English jock? There isn't. There isn't like one. A... But people know what I'm I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there wasn't like I was. I just about got through on the basis I was a good footballer. You know what I mean? So I was in some popular circles, but I was I was odd man for real. Like I I used to. Yeah, I don't even understand well, friendship, for we example. We saw the Cisco video on the TED Talk <laughs> yeah, where you're right. recreating a Cisco dance routine. That was that was as a kid. That was that, that was I'm cute. talking I'm talking teenager. Okay. Yeah, teenager <laughs> I was still that kid. Um yeah, so so but I mean the reason I say that is that there's some some kind of dangerous power dynamics at play there. Cuz if I if I feel like I have 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 not had a certain power growing up or if I was you know then the fact that I suddenly have it I don't know what to do with it and you see that especially with men it can become or boys rather that can become dangerous you know having that power because suddenly I'm just like right well I'm gonna go out every night and you know try and pick up someone and whatever else and get into these kind of cycles of 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 kind of yeah just hedonism yeah pure pure untapped hedonism what, wanting to um annihilate all your thoughts and numb like what was the yeah. what were you chasing what were you wanting out of that i had a noisy brain and the issue i had with um with coke or or or, or just a, a, with an upper I, the whole thing with amphetamines is is that it's actually what how the people medicate adhd yeah so this is just my personal journey i, I you know so Interestingly, my actual abuse, my drug abuse and drug addiction didn't actually stem from me wanting to just go out all the time. It actually stemmed from me staying in because it was the only time I'd ever felt my, vo- my the voices in my head kind of quiet and, and, and become sim- simplify. Mm. Um, not necessarily the greatest thoughts that I was left with, but, but, you know, they were kind of very, I don't know, trashy, but it was, but they were still less thoughts than I had. Yeah. And that, I think that's what drove me towards it. And also, this is another one, I don't think I've ever said this before, I can't remember if I've said this on the podcast. I was fucking anxious, man. This is what I remember too. It was a complete mind fuck being in front of the people I was in front of. People I'd grown up watching on television, like people who, who and I was so, I remember, this has just come back to me now actually, I can feel this in my whole body, but I remember being terrified of saying bi- goodbye to people, right? It was a weird obsession. So I would like go into a room and I'd see someone I'd seen on telly. I don't know who it would be. It could be a footballer, it could be like Jimmy Carr or someone like that, right? And then and then he would talk, oh yeah, no, I've seen you, you know, we're just new you can nuke us on the block, da, 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 da. And I'd be like, all right, cool. Well, I'll see you, I'll see you later, man. And then I'd, I don't know what I'd do, handshake, fist bump, and a hug. Mm. And I would think about the way I said bye to everybody in that room for, oh my God. For like an, an excruciatingly long time. And when I did drugs, I didn't think about that. When I did drugs, I just went into the room and was like, hey, what's good? And then fucking carried on with my night. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Really simple shit. And that's why I can understand why people get into this. I can understand why that scene exists. I can understand the people you meet there is all just this hedonistic. And I missed it for years. When I stopped, I missed that world because it just is this irresponsible escape, you know? Um, but I ended up finding some form of medication from ADHD a few years later, just before the TED talk, I think, and 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 I think that took me off off um, drug abuse, I'd say, because really, I was it was like I say, it was just at home. I was writing loads. Did oh. you have an understanding that you had ADHD before you started taking drugs? I I had been diagnosed once, but I didn't really believe it. <laughs> I didn't like take it mm. very seriously. I got put in a special uh, education unit at school um, for my GCSE, so I was allowed to stand up during my GCSEs. That was it. Um, and then, and then I was later re-diag- re-diagnosed uh, as an adult. Um, and in the middle, I went to New York and, and took a friend of mine's ADHD medication called Adderall. Which, right? And uh, I did it almost as a laugh. And then um, I had this, I like, remember taking this Adderall and we were in New York and we were a bunch of friends. We were having a bit of fun at that time. It was a really great place to go for me in Harley because it was really peak attention for us here. New York, no one knew who we were. And then I suddenly had this calm come over me with this, with this Adderall. And I could think, I was about 22, 23 when this happened, I could think 
about what I was going to say. Fern, I'm not lying to you, right? Before that point with Adderall, I honestly didn't know people could think about what they could, <laughs> what they said. Mm. I thought when people weren't saying anything, they just had nothing to say. Mm. I didn't know that they were considering it. <laughs> so I had, honestly, I at that point used to just say, "What?" I mean, you m- would have remembered that of me, I'm sure. I used to come around your house and I was blah 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 blah. <laughs> Like, because you had those Christmas parties, whatever. Oh, those Christmas that, that, parties. That. I was and telling I would... Anushka, the producer, about these parties earlier. Bloody hell. No, but I would. I honestly, motor mouth. Long. And then I'd think about what I'd, I'd go but away going, fuck, what did I say? You know? Mm. Like, uh, oh, and anyway, so I realised that, you know, I, uh, there was another part of the world, <laughs> which was <laughs> that your thoughts have another space to go to before yeah. you say them. Yeah. So that so that was part of the journey and then eventually I was again diagnosed in Harley Street by a guy who who looked at me and was and said you quite clearly have ADHD. Mm. <laughs> and um I'd also been self-medicating on this stuff and I'd been taking way too much of it. Um this is another story. It right. ju- it's so interesting. I've been learning so <laughs> much about ADHD. I I actually did a King's College course to learn more about it recently. Really? Just wanting to really get to grips because I've had loads of friends diagnosed recently I know a lot of kids who have got it and yeah I'm really desperate to understand more about it and the different presentations I don't even know if I've got it or if Jesse's got it you know all these well they reckon you can develop it now yeah I think but also our demographic went undiagnosed as kids in all areas it just wasn't this stuff wasn't talked about that's why I think there are so many late diagnoses now yeah of course because people are going oh, right, that makes sense as to why I do this, why I do that, and and whatever. And I think it's so interesting because clearly you've now found a medication that really suits you, which is... Well, yeah. Or not. Which is... No, the one... Are you on medication now? No. No, you're not. No, okay. I've come off that as well you've come now. off it. Yeah. But this is the interesting thing because this is what I was learning about on this course is there isn't obviously one route to take no. as a kid or an adult. You've got to find what works for you yeah. and it could be a lifestyle thing. It could be therapy it could be just having that awareness changing something in your life or medication it's got to be and it goes for all you know neurodiversity or mental health problems that there isn't one answer you've got to take this medication you've got to do this you've got to find you have to find what works for you definitely i wouldn't suggest going the route i went necessarily in terms of like yeah accidentally medicating yourself with a, with the worst drug by the way yeah i just think cocaine is just the worst drug but I, I but everyone in london anyway it's just a it's a wild underground yes. is it even underground probably is not. it underground probably not um, probably not I just don't go out, so I don't know anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I remember you, back Of course in the day. you fucking remember. What, music in the 90s? Yeah, you serious? Horrendous. Jesus Christ, they're doing it on their desk at record labels yeah, no, and that. Yeah, quite literally. Yeah. <laughs> like, unbelievable, unbelievable. It is. But, but, you know, but I do, again, mass compassion for why that happens, why people engage in that world. And, and, and um, yeah, like I say, it was, it was based around an insecurity, I suppose, and, and it's just a, a constant, it was a constant crutch. And again, the difficulty for me was I was also very high functioning. Like I said, I was, it got to a point where I was high on, on television and shit, you know, mm. but, but no one would ever know until I've told them on a massive podcast. <laughs> exactly, so, and now we can look back but, and no, but, those episodes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's, it's so interesting because I think, you know, whether people listening to this now have ADHD or not, so many people are gonna re- gonna relate to that social anxiety and how yeah. that individually manifests so for you it's this very cute thing of like saying goodbye to people i still have terrible social anxiety in lots of situations but i'm very good at masking it because for my job yeah, you have to. i can sit and articulate and think about things and be interested in other people's stories etc but i still walk away like i went to a wedding thursday and as i was going to bed my head was like why did you say that? Yeah, what oh, what did mate. you do that for? Why did you, they probably thought you were really awkward? They were probably looking at you thinking you're a dickhead. Like I, I don't know how to eradicate that, and I'm feeling it even while I'm in the situation. I'll, I'll still say things without thinking it through properly and go, why? Why did I just say that? Yeah. Because I'm anxious. I'm nervous. I don't know how I'm being received by other people. It's wild. It's, and I think it's got, certainly over the pandemic, it got worse because we all went into our little holes and hid for ages. And I really went into a little hole and was like, oh, God, this is quite cosy, wonderful. Yeah. And I'm still coming out of it. And I find that, especially in the strange industry that we work in, have worked in, 
where it's so heightened, where you might be in a room with someone that you really admire, or you're with people that are very big characters that seem confident, they might not be, but they're presenting themselves in a way where they're the ringleader of the room, yeah, they're yeah, yeah. courting everybody there and creating some noise, and I just feel like I want to hide. Yeah. I don't know how to deal with that. I think so many, probably more people feel like that than not, I would say. A hundred percent. And also with ADHD, I think generally from the stuff, because I'll, I'll check into certain podcasts and stuff like that. I love listening to... I actually, at the moment, really love listening to like really long form podcasts. I'm listening mm. to like two, three hour ones. It's crazy, but um, ADHD, I think, is becoming more prevalent in society just because of the way society is structured, because of our screen time, yeah. our usage, and because of the encu- just the encouraging of 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 um, unhealthy behaviour. So, you know, I definitely think people are, or if they have some kind of dormant ADHD, or if they are dealt with ADHD, is definitely being like in, you know heightened exact, yeah. you know it's, it's being um i mean yeah. how we live today is it's not sustainable and we all know that in terms of like how much we're on our phone but also how we are seeking distraction like yeah. we didn't you know if we were doing that back in the day it was probably in quite a harmless way we were just like i don't know watching crap tv or we'd buy a magazine or whatever but now you can do like watch TV, read a magazine and be on yeah, TikTok. Yeah, yeah, and you're yeah. like, your brain's going yeah, like yeah, a yeah. ping pong going around a machine. Like, wow, what's I going know. on here? And we're all caught in that cycle and we don't actively seek to counterbalance it that often. Do you have techniques now where you know it will help you to get your brain thinking in a simpler a way or to have that space away from all the craziness? I think one thing that helps me with my ADHD now, I don't, medicate i i find food nutrition is really helpful for me nutrition and exercise so i usually am more erratic if i've eaten something a uh, kind of un um non beneficial for my body yeah and and exercise you know if i'm in a routine i've just been through a phase i mean i've just been away but before that almost a month solid two months solid of of this half an hour training with my friend on Zoom every single day. And I just feel so strong and, and, and you know, they're, they're natural endorphins, natural feelings of goodness and happiness. And I feel I make better decisions when I'm in that space. Um, but food, listen, food is a whole thing. One of my compulsive behaviors that I battle with nowadays is, is body dysmorphia actually, um, which I got a few years ago uh, because of an unfortunate th- that's another story but the point is i i i'm very i i i have an, a dysmorphic idea of what my body is like even if i'm in really good shape i feel like you know you see it when people go to the gym it's a real thing i think it's actually a really silently common issue for men uh, women too but yeah for, but, i think most women have it sadly but yeah men i know don't talk about it that's what i was about to say yeah i haven't heard as much discussion about no, it from a male perspective I but i think it happens i think it happens in a weird extreme way um but i can only talk on behalf of myself and and yeah, it's just like I'll feel sad sometimes when I don't feel as though my, I'm in as good a shape as I could be. Something I'm working on, I speak to my girlfriend about it. But the thing that upsets me kind of externally about it is sure, I have my own responsibility on being kinder to myself, but I also feel like I'm constantly fighting a world that's encouraging not only my body, but everyone else who I love's bodies to have shit things in it. Yeah, and like the and all and it this got totally heightened by me learning about nutrition and being like fucking hell, this is awful. Like this is once I understand what our body needs to be fueled, how that we'd actually need to even eat that much, but when what we do eat needs has to be like this and that, and it seems common sense just to fuel your body with, but then there's encouragement of these really addictive sugars and really addictive fats and them together is like the best thing in the world. And yeah. that, it freaks me out. I get, that's like my, the, the the most severe form of existential dread. And all the stuff in our language, all the colloquialisms and the societal, um, ex- the accepted ways of t- engaging with each other about food encourages that. It's, it's you see the way people talk about those people who want to eat healthily you know, yeah, like, people give me shit about it all the time. It's, it's yeah, it's like it's like oh, like, come oh, on, I guess some you're twigs boring. And seeds, yeah, yeah, it's like, just well. Also, I've got a really dark history of eating disorders, so I need this is I have to be like this. Yeah. I'm, I'm not going back there. Do you know what I mean? But right. it is very. You're totally right. People are like, oh, just have a burger and shut up, like chill out or whatever. And it's like 
this, I want to feel good. I want to have yeah. energy. I want to be healthy. I don't want to be like I used to be back in the day. I want to feel I know. good about myself. And I think it's the same with drinking. You know, if I go out and say, I'm by no means sober, but I rarely drink. I'll probably have, like I went to a wedding last week. I had one glass of champagne. I was absolutely hammered from that. I was like, ah, I need to go home. But if you say, oh, I'm, I'm no, I don't really fancy, I'm not drinking tonight. People are like, what? Yeah. Chill out. Like, have a, have a drink. And, that's a very British cultural oh, thing as well that we massively. get shit for not drinking. Massively, it, it, it it's it's it, it frustrates me. It feels like it's all part of a greater plan to keep everybody trapped in this Numb. in this space. Uh, yeah. yeah, because yeah. what I mean. So if you have to, I feel like I diverted. Then sorry, I kind no, of no, went no. You're into going this, off on great little I went tangents. Into this haze of, I of, love that. Of, I, that's um, what this is about. Yeah. But say you ha- you find yourself due to the work you're doing, whether it's book writing, music, whatever you're talking about, promoting, or you're at an event, there's people that you know there, whatever. Do you still have that surge of social anxiety or do you know how to deal with that now? I think I'm getting better now. I think in comparison to where I was, oh my God, hugely. Because I think as I've got older and as I have gone through more and as I have given my body... Like, for example, recently I, I cut out coffee for me which oh, I don't know if I, I know no 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 listen I've, I I have everyone around me That's adores my it only sin. and I envy no no it's not a sin what listen I moder- drink quite a lot of it. <laughs> <laughs> well look whatever they they for me, for me I I it was I could not avoid what was clearly happening which was that I'd start off I'd have 3 months of bliss yeah. one coffee in the morning great push it to two great yeah. Then it starts getting a bit later, 3 p.m. Uh, da, 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 or like, you know, I feel crazy if I hadn't had the coffee for me because I have That's the addict in me. <laughs> right. drinks it all day. Yeah. But then in the evening, the thoughts were wild. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, and, and it's like, I can't keep doing this. So, for example, now I don't have that. I drink decaf. I love decaf. I'm obsessed. I'll drink like a thousand cu- cups of decaf. <laughs> like, oh, it's only... Um, but if I go to these events, I'll have the thoughts, but I'll be within myself to be like, okay, I'm just gonna let the, let those pass. I definitely, I have to give myself credit here. I've I've definitely got better at that. I don't fear those events so much because I don't think I need anything from them. You know, I'll go there and I'll and the only thing I feel sometimes at these events is I feel like a bit of a um like a misfit sometimes and sometimes. You go. To, I go to events where there's like a clicky crowd or a crowd that I think are really cool Ugh, or something like that. I yeah. can't deal with clicky clicks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but individually, these they're all probably great. But yeah. it just for in 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 me, I just sometimes I it creates this bizarre yeah. like chasm between us. And I and I remember just being in like the playground or whatever. That's the only thing that I think lingers, and then I, and then I begin to kind of overthink people's. But then even then, I'll just take a moment and be like these. Everybody is just a fallible, you know, complex chaos thing. I, I think is... most people in that room are feeling that. Yeah. We're all feeling it, but we all assume everyone else feels really comfortable and like they belong there. And but well, I also thinking... I want everyone. To, I, I you know there'll be that egoic part of me that wants everybody to just to know that I'm amazing. <laughs> oh, you know what I mean? I want everyone to be like, oh, he's so amazing. Like, this is, talk about coolness. What about this guy? <laughs> this guy's the coolest, you know? <laughs> and then I'll say this shit to my girlfriend. She'll be like, what the fuck, you are cool. I'll be like, no, no but I need, I need this. I need these people to say that. I mean, they, <laughs> it's ridiculous, ridiculous. You know I was thinking about this last night and I don't know if it's because somebody said to me, oh, are you watching Love Island? And I was like, I haven't seen it. I've got nothing against the show. I just haven't, I haven't watched it. My only big, big fear with that is that when these people come out of the show and then they've already got like millions of Instagram followers and whatever, yeah. their hope is that they're liked. Yeah. And we all have this. Yeah. And if they're not liked, then it's like, what do they do? They don't know how to cope because they're now really famous, but people don't like them or whatever. But we're all feeling this on social media, but actually we have forever throughout history in our lives. We want to be liked. And I was thinking, why is that? It's obvious. It's nice to be liked, but yeah. what is the deep down historic, like the prehistoric feeling of I want to be liked? You know, is it tribal? We want to be part of a gang, so we feel safe and we feel connected. Like, what is that? Like, I think for a lot of us, our fear is driven from we're just so terrified that people aren't going to like us and that 
you know, when you leave my house today that you might think, oh, I didn't like that, don't like that, or whatever. Like, that's our worst fear, that we're disliked. It's so, it's a powerful thing. I think for me, thing. I think for me it's, it's just a, a battle of self-worth, isn't it? Because yeah. to worry about being liked for me means that I've placed my value in the in, a, in an external people. opinion. Mm. So I, I feel I least care when the value is sat with me. So if yeah. I if I go into a space and I'm like, no, I I, I know where I'm at, what I've done. Literally, it, and I can I, I know this is true for me because I can measure it. So if I if I've sat down and written like two pages of a book and I love it and I'm buzzing and I'm imagining, you know, I'm living in my own imagination about where all these things will go and I go into a room and I'm confident about the fact that I will be going back to that book at some point and that's something I can, it's a purpose, just a purpose, you know, a goal, all these things that the human, the soul needs. I'm not going to be too fucked about who, what person thinks I'm da 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 da. In that, in that environment, in that moment, if I have just, you know, not got a job or something I thought was going to go well or whatever kind of, valuation and then I go into a room I suddenly need something from that room do you know what I mean yeah. so I think in a world where we are at, it, I really feel like there's so many things in this world that actively try to deconstruct us well they, of course they do it, yeah. it you know breaks us down consumerism is 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 built on inadequacy yeah. it, you know they it, the the these corporations or these big brands they need a person to feel like they need them in order to feel better yeah. you need to have this person's name on your chest otherwise you've got no social currency or you need this otherwise you know what i'm saying like get this quickly before you go on holiday otherwise you'll look you know what i mean or it's just it's all based around us not feeling secure mm. um so I, I can understand why we all end up that because we get hammered with it when we're young and yeah. and and also yeah and then you say and then it's just a normal thing of like well it is just really lovely when when that when that comes um, but you know then there, there are ancient spiritual practices which is you know you're not you are to treat critique as you are to treat compliments mm -hmm. you're not even supposed to get taken away by compliments you know yeah what I mean? yeah which it's is all wild. a neutrality that yeah. you have to just sit with and go. It is what it is. Like yeah. some people are going to like us. Some people aren't going to like us. Sometimes we're going to be accepted. Sometimes we're not. It's just life, isn't it? But we're all desperate. And, you know, going back to your book, because I know that there's obviously that that's the message. But this alludes to that addiction in a sense. Yeah. It doesn't have to be drug addiction, but it's the addiction for more, for the end result, for the big shiny bit that, you know, Kids get in small hits, Pokemon cards, toys, the TV yeah, yeah, show, yeah, yeah, YouTube, yeah. whatever it is. But we're we're worse than you know we're we're doing it. Adults are doing it all day, Massively. every day, looking for the next. When will I be okay? When who's going to fix me? And it's yeah. It, and I know that from when we've spoken on text, you've got obviously an inherent understanding of that. But you're don't know how to replace the word journey, so I'm going to use the word journey. But yeah. your journey has been about getting that without the stuff, without the things, without the exterior. Yeah, it's an off. inside job. And it's not like, yay, Jordan's done that one tick. Like, that's not a game. That one's a lifelong, mm. you just got to keep going yeah, the, back to it. Yeah, the game theory in that respect is a hard one, isn't it? What, yeah. what, where, where, what, where does that game end? It, I mean, I, I suppose setting achievable reasonable goals, you know, that, that you can have little games in the big game. You know what I mean? You can have little little achievements um but yeah I, I i think i think um i definitely want to be in a place of self-validation for sure that's the kind of goal i have friends who have this ability to be able to just create love what they create put it out and just and i love that i love that energy um but it's it's I just think as I'm getting older, more responsibilities come in. I have to start making more rational decisions. And then I I sit and observe the consequences of those decisions and then pivot and, and figure out if in this situation, maybe I actually need less of something or I don't need any more, you know. Um, but I'm learning the whole time because also life's changing so rapidly. Yeah. And, and I think... Um, I'm fascinated by people. I really am fascinated by the world and people. And um, yeah, I, th I I think that helps me. I, I really, I want to have a strong idea of, of self and also a detached idea of self. That's the dream, you know? And it comes in waves. Often, when I've eaten well for a week. <laughs> 
and I had some sleep. Yo. And I had your the decaf five tent poles. Yeah. Has, has Donna been on here? Uh, no, okay. no. The, the, she is coming on in September. Great for the okay. So, so in her book, I'm sure I haven't read all of it. Yet. I started reading it last week. It's amazing. She will mention the five tent poles of whatever, and I've said this before on podcasts because it's just everyone needs it, and it's it's it's. Oh, maybe I'll let Donna say it, actually. You can say it. You can, you can, can I? tee yeah. up Donna. Okay. No. <laughs> well, it's just that it's just a lot of the time in life when we do feel a little off centre, one of the tent poles is, is off and that's yeah. fine. And then you can just know that there are other reasons. It's not just your thoughts or people's ideas or whatever else. There's other reasons. So sleep, nutrition, exercise, creativity, solitude, slash um, community, you yeah. know. Walks in nature. Six tent poles. Fuck the six. <laughs> <laughs> Walks in See, nature. See, my sleep and uh, solitude temples have gone awry. They're bent. They've been like smashed by a hammer. I need those ones back in. Yes. Yeah, so I've listen, had no solitude. No solitude. I'm fucking <laughs> awful on sleep. I need solitude. Parents' life is, I mean, there Just needs to be some it. other temples for parent life. There really does. You have to find mental solitude. In the in the craziness and the chaos, I think. Where where's your self compassion at? Not only for you today, because I think this is the thing that we all need to work on constantly: is self compassion, yeah. acceptance, whatever you want to call it. But how is your self compassion for when you were making, as you've called them, bad choices, whether it's yeah, drugs yeah. or partying or looking for outside validation? How's your compassion for that version of yourself? Oh, you know what? I don't know. I feel like it's dead. I feel like that. I feel like it's a different version of me. I feel like that, that person's died. But can you feel at least grieved? Sort of, grieved, yeah. perhaps. But maybe I've yeah. grieved. I do. I do think you're. I think you're right. Actually, I think that's something I haven't confronted. I haven't gone back there and maybe hugged that part of myself or 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 under, I understand why. I def. You know what? I definitely understand why. Yeah. I made. I I made those decisions and 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 was in that world totally. I totally get it. Yeah. But I, I feel quite, like, especially in lockdown, I went in a whole other way in terms of I really wanted to make myself strong, man, and, and self-sufficient, and, like, I just came out of lockdown, like, ready. It was this other energy that I hadn't, I don't think I'd focused on in myself. I have um, I don't know what to call it. I don't know whether I'm going to put an, an, a masculine or feminine energy on it. I don't know whether that's right. I haven't thought about it, but... There's definitely a fierce energy that came out where I was like, okay, here are my boundaries, you know, and and I'm kind of no fucking, you know, and sometimes I had to accept, I have to be, I had to be hard, like not hard on myself, but I think I had to go, that's not me anymore, yeah, and I had to let it go, mm. because I definitely have a tendency of 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 holding on to things, and I and and I do it. We have such a weird world now, man. Like, in my phone, I've got my phone. I've got... This is another weird fact about me. I have... I don't know how to get rid of it, but I've got, like, f- some, like, 65,000 photos on my phone. <laughs> oh, oh I, I think I've got more. <laughs> no way! Yeah, it terrifies me. I don't know... I, I can't I, I get rid of I'm them. I'm a technophobe. I don't know how to make put them anywhere else. No, I, I can't... Do. I'm a, not a technophobe. Do I put them on a... You have to change USB? your entire... No, no, you have to change your entire iCloud... I, it's, I t- I'm too scared. Yeah. No, same. I don't know. It ter- all of it terrifies me. I don't want to lose them, but I so also you've got need them since... not on my phone. Right. It's me too. This yeah. is it. Stuff like that stresses me, so, so I pretend it's like not happening. Twenty. This goes back to... My phone goes back to about 2012. Wow. <laughs> 2013. So Actually, some... I think mine does. Yeah. I think I've got pictures of when Rex was born on there. <laughs> just... Mad shit. Mad. So I'll get like I'll get sometimes on my phone I'll, it'll go like here's a memory oh, like, listen, and from it, 1964. Yeah. <laughs> it'll be like 2014, and I'll be like holy shit, and then I'll sit with it, but then I do just let it go. Yeah, it just feels. Different. That's good because that's I've talked to Donna about this a lot, and it's still something that I want to. I've just got more healing to be done on the me in a certain era of my life, and, you know. I've done everything that everyone else has done. I've been mean to people I shouldn't have. I've, oh. I, you know, I've done silly things that I regret, and I hold on to them too tightly. And oh, really? To, like, you don't forgive myself. yourself for it? No, I've still got a lot of work to do. Okay. But then there are like darker bits of my life where I'm like, I do need to hug that version of myself. Really? But even going back to bits of it is like, I can't. I'm not there. I'm not ready. I can do it a bit here and there, but it's not like a. I haven't found the peace bit yet. Does Donna not say that you should? Peace. You should 
go back and hug that version. Yeah, we talk about it a lot and we're going to do some more sort of ceremonial work yeah, yeah, and yeah. some cool stuff together Yo. where we really get stuck in. But yeah, it's all self-compassion based stuff. Do you think your do you think the fear of confronting that version of you contributes to some of the ways you act now. Oh yeah, for sure. Like I, do, I had terrible sleep last night. I get really bad night anxiety. Right. Um, I've had quite a good patch of sleeping, but last night, all every worry that could ever be created was in my head, and I was just like, "Oh, I am absolutely fucked." And I've got a really long day today, and the kids are off school already, and it was just like, Bleh. and it is. I know that if I go back to certain eras and I've got to make peace I'm already waiting for that tidal wave of self-loathing first that I've got to work oh, through oh man I'm so aware of all this and I've done so much therapy but it's still there's still stuff to be done and I'm quite accepting of that and I'm quite accepting that it might take years or forever and I'm kind of fine with it because I've always got something to talk about I've got books to write I've got things to the get stuck thing. into well to work with all that shit okay and get it out how are you with anger? Um, yeah, I can get, I'm quite reactive, which is again something I need to... No, I don't think so. I mean, reactive, rage isn't good. No, it's never rage, but I can get, yeah, I can get pretty angry. Anger was, for for me, that was actually a real way out of stuff for me. Really? What, to have a a cathartic release to get it out? I think, my my therapist and I, I feel, and I believe her, it makes sense. A a lot of my self-destructive, self-abusive, behaviors was inverted anger Mm. anger that could have been expressed healthily healthy anger is like i say boundaries is that anger towards other people exclusively or sometimes towards yourself i think the anger towards the other person isn't it could be an anger towards the self because you have allowed that to happen yeah do you know what i mean so in a dream world you know we have our we have our boundaries and we value them that's it so if we were to honor our boundaries then we we're in that Oh, I think I've got a lot more anger than I thought. Yeah, well, that's not, uh, listen, I'm not fucking qualified for that at all. I, I just, yeah. whenever I speak to my friends or, you know, because obviously I've been through the bridge of Donna. I've done, yeah. I did a, a retreat just a couple of week, weekends ago, actually, with a bu- group of men, which was great. Amazing. Called a band of brothers, which was amazing. But it's, it speak to people and it's, it's one of the worst aspects of, of this type of Western society in Britain is this kind of staunch, you know, one mustn't express ones, you know, and then you get the other extreme, which is the kind of rah, yeah, you know, but there's yeah. not this middle bit, which is like, just say, I mean, Donna would say it's saying, ouch, you know, it's just going, ah, no, yeah, ah, like that, because we think, we overthink it, or we shouldn't, maybe it's rude, or, mm. or you know, or, or you're putting ourselves second because that's what we learned as a child. Yeah. It's really hard to do it, but if you can do it, I think you are rewarded by a sense. You're telling yourself, oh, you you value your, mm, this space. Mm. Really hard, by the way. Not, but I'm you know. getting much better at that one. I felt a shift even only, like a few weeks ago, I just felt something shifting. Like, what is this? Like, I couldn't put my finger on it. I was like, do I cut all my hair off? What is this? Like, what is this thing? There's <laughs> yeah, something you happening. Get it out. There's something that's going on. And I had a couple of really good little tests from the universe of like, this, this, minor things, nothing that's going to, like, rock my world. And I could feel myself going into the habitual thing of self-loathing. I've done something wrong. I wasn't aware. Oh, God. I've done something wrong. And then I thought, no, actually, no. Good. No, this is your shit. Wrong thing is the worst. The wrong thing is the worst. I hate that. That's my my default in everything is I, my biggest fear and my go-to is I've done something wrong, but I didn't even realise. Yeah, oh, it's it's, it's that extra bit of, I didn't know I like got it wrong. Thing. I didn't know I had it wrong. I thought I was doing the right thing, and you're telling me I got it wrong. I empathise with that so That is below much. my, that runs below my life always. Fear of wrong. Yeah, I, but but this, me oh, not getting it, like, oh I'm so stupid God. that I didn't even know that was wrong. Like, that's, I go back to it. But last week I thought, no, I'm not going There's back some to that. Ang- it's got to be a fucking anger there, man. I, yeah. Do you know what? This is so deep. Because that is one of my main triggers is mm. I have a fear that I'll be wrong and because I'm wrong, someone will leave. Yeah. That, uh, honestly, so bad that I had it the other day with like one of my closest friends. And it was, I was battling between my objective rationale and the deep wound that it was. So we had a, a debate. It was a heated debate. 
he believes something, I believe something. But because he be- so believed that I wasn't right, because he believed I was wrong, he believed I was wrong, I started to think, fuck, what if this is, what if? Because I've, because I've got a bit wrong in his eyes, he's never going to speak to me again. Mm. Like, and then I'm sat there, I'm, and I'm sat there going, what? I can't, be- I can't, I was actually upset. Mm. I couldn't believe I was thinking that. Mm. Of course he's not. This is someone I love. You know what I mean? Wild. So it, it's, it's deep set. And I had the responsibility that day to try and do what I could. And actually, hilariously, because I have no vices anymore. I don't even smoke cigarettes anymore, really. I just ended up eating loads of cake, to be honest. <laughs> but I was aware, at least. It yeah, wasn't you ideal. You were doing it, it wasn't ideal. Yeah, it wasn't ideal. But it's but the it, awareness. It, it you think, I know I'm, I do that. Oh, I, I certainly will comfort eat and go... I know why. I know why I'm doing. This. I would not say. I don't think people should comfort eat. Mm. But I, I, but it was just. It was a real. It was my almost my number one. Like I was really. Yeah. So and then outside of it, then I kick into what I've got to do, which is you know, protein, good food, yeah. r- running. Oh my god, running. Running. But I think the anger thing, man. I think it's just like going back and just fucking destroying these these things yeah. for you. In your imagination, destroying the things that have made you feel that way. Like yeah. you're allowed to be, I'm saying this as if I'm, again, I'm not qualified, but I feel like you're allowed to just have a space. My therapist and I form these spaces where I can just be fucking ever and just get it done. Yeah. You know what I mean? Get it out. And then. Yeah, sometimes I will do that when I'm running. I'll be like, I will be Usain Bolt around the park. Yeah. I am getting, it, getting out. it out of my system. I want it out of my body, but I need to almost do that every day yeah, like get because there's probably years and years of shit that i need to just get out of but it's so interesting that thing about believing you've got it wrong because i don't even think i've got a fear of the other person leaving the scenario yeah no, that's my definitely fear, specifically me that's but i think it manifests in different ways my fear is i'm just a shitty person you're just shit yeah i'm just a shitty person and I don't deserve anything that I have, and other people. Oh, like imposter syndrome. Yeah. Oh, hugely. Like have that you one... have you spoken to your therapist? Is this a, something you've been working on? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. About, all I'm, I'm the guessing. time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All the time. All the time. Because like it, it goes back to, I'm a shitty person. I haven't done enough to help. I haven't done enough. Whatever it might be, I'm full stop. I'm a shitty person. Like it just ends. That's so wild. That is where it ends, and I. That's now I'm in my forties. That's where I want to go. Hmm. This needs to be deleted. This sentence because it's just boring. It's yeah. been boring to go yeah. back to that all the time. You know what am I aiming for? To be like a saint, a perfect. Like we're we're humans. Yeah, we wild. fuck up. We do things wrong. We can be a shitty person and we can be a beautiful person. It's we just can be like all of it. It, uh, it must be. Uh, for me anyway, I feel like it must be a thing where we or I or you uh, are so. Uh, used to it's just a comfortable space it's like it's uh, easy it's easier yeah and that other place because if we were to use my trigger being the, the abandonment thing the discomfort the discomfort in that place is going well you know i've said what i said <laughs> that literally it's that energy i said what i said yeah. Do you know what i mean that's that's the space where because I, I i always want to i always want to find union and as i get older what i really want to get to is a place where it's like this is what i believe and I'm happy to open for other ideas, but in this moment, this is what I, you know what I mean? Just standing by it. Yeah. And and not being nice. I've been nice a long time. That was the thing I was trying to get out in this, in this retreat the other day was to get rid of this fucking nice thing. I'm, I, I like being kind to people, but sometimes I, people need to fuck off. <laughs> I know. Do you know what I mean? Sometimes, and I need to be cooler. That's the uncomfortable place. I'm going to stand the fact that you need to fuck off and then yeah. we can talk about this another time. It's a boundary. Yeah. And, uh, but that's, you got to live in that for a bit so it becomes comfortable. It's the same as anything. Yeah. It's like freaking out when you get in water. It's like water being cold until exactly. it's not, you know. Wim Hof, man, has Wim he been Hof. on here? Yes. Well, they all tell Wim you about Hof. that. We love Wim, we love Wim. You know? But it is, none of us want to sit in discomfort because it's not nice. It's that simple. But it's the place of growth. It's the place of Pain, learning. pleasure, balance, man. It is, and it's the place of, like, it is, it's balance, isn't it? It's the equilibrium of going, you know, there's good and bad and and light and dark and whatever it is, it's all coexisting and we have to see it all and And, and also I bet it. I bet that fucking feeling of like actually getting something wrong and just accepting it is bliss. Yeah. <laughs> I, bet, I bet that's bliss. Yeah. I did get that wrong. Anyway. Yeah, I did that last week. I actually apologised to someone, but very neutrally. I didn't feel like self loathing. I just I'm really I'm really sorry that that's how you feel and that I've contributed to that and I'm very, very sorry. And I, f- I, I left that peacefully. Yeah. 
That was good. Yeah. Human Saying lives. sorry is a good one. It's a real good one. Jordan, I could talk to you for about five hours longer because we could just even hone in on anger for like another hour and just go. I in wanted on that, to, I but... wanna I wanna I wanna um say though about the missing yeah, piece. Yeah, go on. Uh that that uh I have actually written the book for adults. That's the that was that's the kind of thing. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So so my I've done a deal with Bloomsbury, which is amazing. I, I came to them with this idea. I had this idea for about six years. Um because I I just had an idea. I had this I was I was interrogating my own um ob- obsession with completing things. Yeah. Right? And 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 just more and more and more and more and more. And it was only when I was reading my friend's kid a book called The Fox and the Star. So um I love that book. Right, yeah. So shout out that author because it is straight up inspired so me useful. to write a kid's book. Don't know if they'll listen, but it'd be cool if they did. And then I read it and was like, what the fuck? This is deep. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I so I was like, maybe that idea I had in my head I can make into a kid's book. So that's it. I put a tweet out you know, someone put me in touch with this wonderful woman called Julia Churchill, shout out, who was unbelievably patient with me. <laughs> Three years for me to do one redraft. <laughs> I did, I met up with her, told her the idea. She's like, this is great. In Waterstones and Piccadilly. She's like, this is a great idea. Write it down, send it to me. Wrote it down. And she was like, it's not quite what you had said. You know, just have a think about it. And then, over the course of three years, I changed the lead character to a dinosaur. I changed. I I I wrote a different kids book. So a different kids book. She's going. She's going. No no no. But just what you said to me on that, that time. You know, checked in on me every six months. And then three years later, I'd got writer's block. Horrendous. And I went. Well, if I got writer's block, I might as well look at the things I've already written. Open up this kids book. And then I've seen that I've added this bizarre storyline. When the original one I gave to her, I'd added this kind of like. I'd made the grandma into like a detective anyway. It was really weird. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I just was like, well, I'll delete that then. So I just deleted it. And she's like, okay, great. That was it. <laughs> Three years. I just hot- deleted half of it. And then, <laughs> then she sent it around. Uh... Bloomsbury me up with me. And Bloomsbury, out of, out of all the kids' books were, were amazing. But they were like, look, we think you can write more. So I've got a, a deal to write three kids' amazing. books with them. And I've written the second one. I've got the outline of the third one. But my... My goal, my kind of, I don't know what it is, manifesto, is that the books, I'm, I, I want them to be engaging for kids. I want them to love the colours, like Beth Susanna, incredible yeah. illustrator in this book. Beautiful the pictures. colours are unreal. And I had to pick from a lot. It was a crazy situation to deal with all these different people's versions of Sunny, this character that I'd lived in my mind. But Beth, there was something about the colour she used. Um, but the story, man, it's like, you know. It's for adults. Yeah. Because I want people to have that feeling I had when I read The Fox and the Star or where it's like. No, oh, I got it straight away. Really. My kids were like, as you say, engaged. In the yeah, there's repetition. And the and... And... But I was like, I get the sentiment. Do you know what I mean? I and, and it, especially with the missing piece, this is, this, is a, this is a fucking ancient sentiment. This is, yeah. this is, this, we've heard this all throughout our, our life, but it just, it's, it's, it's giving that, it's giving that, that lesson, that journey through the lens of a young of a young girl and then also just adding a little sprinkle of um of elders eldership which yeah. i really wanted to add the theme of of how important i wouldn't say cuz not everyone is 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 lucky enough to have grandparents or or there might not be grandmothers or whatever but definitely having a, a another tier that yeah. i think that's so important with child I mean, intergenerational I'm, even friendships are so important yeah. like one of my i've got two Three really good mates, all in their seventies, yeah, and that wow. is a different conversation. That is a different mindset, wisdom. Like we need all of that. It's really important. Yeah, really important. Yeah, but it's beautiful. Well done. It's amazing. I love it, and it's so exciting that you're putting all of your thoughts and creativity into a, another beautiful thing. Yeah, I, 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 I yeah. I, thank you for um for reading it to your kids. It's that's super exciting. Oh well, they loved it, and I loved it, and it's been so good talking to you today. So thank you, Jordan. Cheers, fan.